America's youngest population will soon be able to get the COVID-19 shot if they want. So until now, babies, toddlers, and preschoolers were not eligible for a COVID vaccine. But yesterday, the Food and Drug Administration voted to approve the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines for children as young as six. Here to discuss this latest development is science journalist Catherine J. Wu. She has a PhD in microbiology and immunobiology. Welcome to the show, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me. So help us understand the application here. Uh, a lot of folks believed that the uh, negative impacts of COVID were pretty minimal on younger folks in the first place. That's why they weren't prioritized. What do folks hope to gain by vaccinating their kids? Yeah, it's a really important question. And I think uh, a lot of parents have actually been done a disservice by hearing that message repeatedly since the start of the pandemic. You know, it is true that younger children are at less risk of, you know, really severe outcomes from COVID-19 than older adults. But I think what's actually important to keep in mind is that's not necessarily the best comparison to make. What we do have to think about is the outcomes that kids were having before the pandemic. They were not dying as frequently. They were not being hospitalized as frequently. They weren't getting things like long COVID and that rare inflammatory condition called MISC. And they could, you know, return to most of that life if they were to be vaccinated. There is an immense threat posed to kids by COVID-19 and the vaccine is something that turns this into a vaccine preventable disease, but only if kids are able to get that shot as soon as possible. What about the idea that it's hard to see for very young kids, it's hard to see because they are not, you know, hospitalized or die at you know near anywhere near approaching the rates of older americans that it's hard in, in the data to see you know discernible necessarily improvements and then also you know versus the concerns that some have and again i think they're they're you know very mild concerns you know uh, negative experiences with the vaccine among these kids but if you you know if you don't if it's hard to see a lot of good anyway, then it, they, you were seeing a, a little bit of concern and a very little bit of, of good. The calculus for whether to do it seems uh, much more difficult than for, you know, a 65 plus American who, you know, obviously has a, 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 a very a much more substantial chance of a negative health outcome if they if they contract COVID than they would if they've been vaccinated. Yeah, you bring up a really good point, you know, that basically, you know, anytime you want to roll out a vaccine, you want that risk benefit math to work out. And it's a lot harder to do when, you know, you're comparing very few outcomes in one hand with very few outcomes in the other hand. That is absolutely true. But actually, uh, not having that many hospitalizations or deaths in the trials has been an issue from the start, even in older age groups. And that's why, you know, vaccine makers actually, you know, initially looked at efficacy against any symptomatic disease. So if you just feel sick and you test positive for this coronavirus, that counts as one of the outcomes that they're looking at. Does the vaccine reduce the incidence? And actually with the kids trials, knowing that kids are less likely to get sick in general, what uh, the vaccine makers did is this technique called immunobridging. They looked at, you know, we, well, we know this vaccine works well in adults and we know we get this really great antibody response in people who get the vaccine and are older than 18. Can we produce a similar level of antibodies in these kids if we're using this lower dose and sort of use that as a way to say, well, if A equals B and B equals C, maybe A equals C. You know, it's not a direct way to do it, but it's a way to run these trials without recruiting, you know, many, many, many more children than they would have had to. Uh, but, you know, also there are concerns about vaccine safety. But uh, what I just mentioned, that they cut the amount of vaccine down the shot for kids, that was done deliberately to minimize side effects as much as possible. They were looking for the minimal dose that would still produce an adequate immune response in these kids, knowing that, you know, really, really shooting low there would minimize the chances of side effects. And they really did not see anything concerning. Some kids got fever but that happens quite often with any sort of pediatric vaccine. And they didn't see any cases of myocarditis, you know, that heart inflammation that has very rarely cropped up with some of these mRNA vaccines. And I think what's actually really encouraging, I know it was a long wait for parents and it was very frustrating for many people who were waiting for these vaccines to finally come out. But we now have more than a year and a half of data to back up that these vaccines are safe in every age group tested and they should be the safest in the group that gets the least vaccine seen in each shot, and that is going to be this youngest group of kids.
When I looked at the data on you know, which kids were getting hospitalized with COVID, it, it looked like you, you had uh, a majority, perhaps even an overwhelming majority with uh, underlying health conditions or with obesity or severe obesity. Um, is, is, there, is there any thought or, or, or discussion about you know, recommending the vaccine you know, specifically in those cases, you know, if you have a, a, a child, a baby, a toddler, a teen, whatever, who is at elevated risk because they have a health condition, then that calculus might be very, very different than just, the, you know, than a, than a child who doesn't have one of those uh, underlying uh, issues. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think that the way to look at this is just reminding ourselves that risk is a spectrum. It's not like get the vaccine or don't, but who may need the vaccine the most. But I think the baseline uh, premise here is gonna be that every kid who gets this vaccine is going to benefit from it. And there are gonna be certain groups of kids who benefit even more because they belong to a riskier group. But I think we also do have to keep in mind that even though there is uh, maybe a higher chance of having those uh, outcomes like hospitalization and death in kids who have those underlying health conditions, which is also true in older kids and in adults, um, um, there are also uh, things that kids can suffer from when they catch this virus that aren't really well understood in terms of risk factors. Long COVID, for instance, MISC, for instance, uh, it's not really well understood. They don't seem to have the same exact risk factors uh, that seem to land kids in the hospital with you know, severe respiratory disease. Uh, that's really complicated. And so any kid is going to have some risk of having a bad outcome with COVID-19. And that's really important to keep in mind. Um, you know, I think it would be wrong to assume assume that only a subset of kids need this vaccine and everyone else is fine. Every kid is going to have some risk. But of course, you know, it is especially important for kids with underlying risk factors to go out and get those shots as soon as they can. Catherine, can you talk a little bit more about long COVID in MISC? Because I don't think we've talked a lot about it uh, on this show. And there is some skepticism about whether or not this is, you know, real, if it's uh, COVID related, the, p the feelings that people are having, if it's uh, symptoms that emerge out of the lockdown or something else that's going on. And there are some hesitancy from folks who think that maybe an emphasis on long COVID is a kind of stopgap measure after a lot of the promises that were made about the vaccine in terms of its ability to stop transmission in, in the pandemic turned out to not to be true. Now, some people think the long COVID is just another fear tactic to say, okay, go ahead and get the vaccine, even though it doesn't necessarily keep you from getting COVID. Um, and even though, uh, it, it is, uh, doesn't uh, affect transmiss transmissibility the way we thought it would. Yeah, so, uh, you know, there are sort of two very different conditions that we're talking about here. MISC and long COVID are very, very, very different. And I, I will say, you know, both are not completely understood uh, in this population. We are still, I think, working with a paucity of data. Uh, but, you know, MISC is this rare inflammatory condition, but it has impacted thousands of kids in the U.S. And it is really, really serious. Uh, it's not always clear, you know, you can't look at a child on the street and say, oh, you know, this child clearly has conditions X, Y, and Z. They are at high risk for MISC. Uh, it can crop up in, you know, healthy kids who are one day, you know, playing in the park. They catch this virus and a few weeks later they are, you know, having this, um, you know, widespread inflammation that can be incredibly dangerous. Uh, and this is something that pediatric ID specialists are really trying to understand at this point. But the wonderful thing is there have been studies, especially looking at older kids uh, who have already had this vaccine available to them for months, showing that vaccination does really reduce uh, the likelihood of a child developing MISC. Um, there is also a little bit of a paucity of data with long COVID. It's not as well, it's not well understood even in adults, especially how likely it is, but vaccination does seem to reduce the likelihood in adults and there's every expectation that it would do so in kids. It's important to emphasize here that we're not expecting it to completely eliminate the risk of long COVID, but there are very few interventions in life that can completely eliminate the risk of anything. Uh, you know, long COVID is complicated. Uh, certainly uh, no one is arguing that 
every child who catches the coronavirus is going to get long COVID. But if there is a chance of reducing that, that's pretty important. Uh, I've talked to a lot of pediatricians who have treated kids, um, you know, who are experiencing these long-term symptoms. And it's not just that, you know, your kid has cold symptoms for months on end. It really affects their cognitive development. It affects the way that they're going to be able to play and interact with their friends. And these kids are so young. This is a chronic condition and everything we understand in adults, this is something that could potentially affect kids for years on end. It's just a crucial point in their lifetime. You also did bring up mental health and it absolutely is difficult to diagnose something like long COVID, uh, you know, something that can have so many different symptoms and it's not always easy for a little kid to articulate what's going on uh, with how they're feeling and how they're interacting with their world. But I think it is important to think about, you know, vaccination will also have these amazing community level benefits, having reduced transmission, even if it doesn't go completely to zero, vaccination should be expected to make kids less sick, make the virus less easy to pass on, which means fewer outbreaks, fewer classroom closures, fewer teachers and school nurses leaving their posts or being out sick, fewer parents being pulled out of work to care for their kids. Kids will be able to resume more normalcy. They'll be able to interact more safely with each other. And we know we are having a huge mental crisis, mental health crisis in this country. We're hoping that, you know, vaccination will help chip away at some of that burden. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. We appreciate it. And we'll be back with more Rising right after this.